Hey, this is Royce Hall, your host of the Well Science Podcast, and I'm joined by Tony Bouquet today. Good to have you, Tony. Same here, Royce. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah, it's great to have you. So, Tony, you're with uh, the American College of Financial Services, uh, but you've also uh, written a book about being a modern solutionary. Yes. Tell me about that. That's a that's a great title. Like, where did that come from and what does that mean? <laughs> Man, that's a long story. It's a lot longer <laughs> story than we have here. Uh, I've, I've always been fascinated with why people do the things they do, you know, I, and in my career, as you said, I'm, bit, I'm with the American College, but I was also a professional in the financial services arm of the industry. And I started at a really young age. I started at 21 years old. And I always saw myself as a problem solver. You know, I helped people solve their problems when it came to risk protection, such as insurance, or financial matters, as in you know, developing wealth, then distributing that wealth as it needs to be. So it started a long time ago with my interest as, you know, I'd meet couples and I'd have interviews with couples and it was obvious they were doing silly things that blew up their life, you know, and, and I, I always want, and they were intelligent people, you know. So I always questioned, well, why, why do people do those things? What causes that? What makes someone think that that's a very good decision, you know? And, you know, so I started my research on that. And this started a long time ago. And I've, I've used a lot of this research through the years in, in speaking. I've done a lot of public speaking in, in my career. And, you know, some of my close friends said, Tony, you're not getting any younger. One day you're not going to be here. You got to write this stuff down. And I never wanted to write a book. It never was on my bucket list, Royce. But, you know, the more I heard that, the more I said, yeah, I'd like to do that. I had a, a mentor, uh, Mr. Ogmandino, who wrote books in a modern fable format. And I thought that was so cool because it kept your interest while also teaching you things. So I decided in homage to him that I would write my book in that same format, in a modern fable format. And I've been blessed to have done that. So. It was fun. It was uh, it was very interesting. the 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 title or the name solutionary. Uh, in '09, I started calling myself a solutionary on social media, and you know back then when you'd Google solutionary, you'd get zero hits. I mean none. There was nothing out there for solutionary, but I thought it was a cool name for the term problem solver or the, fa the the phrase problem solver. And so I started using it. And today there's millions of hits for solutionary. Uh, mostly, you know, I would imagine from my book, the book helped get that name out in public. And it, it, it's a cool term. In ancient Greek, it means tool of wisdom. So solutionary meant tool of wisdom, and the book was on wise decision making. So it just worked out perfect. And, uh, you know, I've been blessed. I learned more about wise decision making than any of my readers. I read 111 books in one year to write one book. So it was <laughs> it was an interesting journey. And it's been a long, you know, a long road. But yeah. uh, it's been fulfilling. Yeah, that's fantastic. So, so for the people listening, uh, uh, remind us of the name of your book. And is that something that, like we can get on Amazon, or like where will we find that? You can. It's on Amazon, of course. It's called the uh, Bloodline of Wisdom: The Awakening of a Modern Solutionary. That's the full title. But you can type in the Bloodline of Wisdom, and it, it'll come up. Uh, you also can get it at my website, modernsolutionary.com. The Modern Solutionary uh, website allows you to order the book, and I'll be happy to sign the book for the person as well. So it's a, another option they have if they'd like that. 
Fantastic. So, you know, with that idea of the modern solution area, like one of the things that we explore on the Wealth Science Podcast is, you know, what's going on in, in the financial services space? Like, what are the advancements that are uh, happening and maybe more like personally, like what are the ones that are like, as a, 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 a solutionary yourself, which are the ones that are like intriguing and exciting to you? Royce, that's a great question. I mean, there's so many of them. Uh, this profession is is changing and and evolving in ways I never dreamed of 39 years ago when I entered the field. You know, one of the things that, that comes to mind immediately was the impact that Zoom, this, this tool that you're using today, you know, if we would have had a pandemic in the 70s or 80s, this would have collapsed this profession probably because, you know, people only did business face to face. You had to be in the presence. They had to physically sign their name to documents. There, there was no other alternative to that, you know? And think, thinking of how we came through this pandemic and, and advisors and professionals never missed a beat because of Zoom and the technology that we have today. So that's exciting to me. I mean, to think that uh, we put a stop, we, we literally, close down the biggest economy in the world, you know, brought it to a screeching halt. And to think that we were able to do that and still conduct business, still help people with their finances, people didn't lose money in the deal, people didn't lose protection, the ability to, to protect themselves with insurance, nothing was affected negatively because of the pandemic. Now, some people picked up on it quicker than others, of course, but for the most part, it it worked seamlessly to the public. Uh, there was, you know, background issues <laughs> that we had to deal with, uh, but it was, it was cool. It was, it was very interesting to see this experiment, if you will, take place right in front of our eyes. And uh, that was exciting. Yeah, that's amazing to think about just, you know, your statement that, you know, if this had happened, you know, in the 70s and 80s, it would have closed down the industry. You know, that's, that's you know, fascinating thing to kind of just imagine, right? Uh, you know, I think maybe uh, on the, the flip side of that, like in the sales and business development world, you know, I, I kind of look at the the Zoom maybe a little bit differently in that, like, man, the best relationships are still made in the flesh, right? Like, that's right. You know, you and I can have this uh, this podcast right now, even though we're many miles apart. But how much stronger would our relationship with one another be if we were in the room shaking hands? You know, so it's right. It's, uh, it, it, this doesn't. Like it I don't think. I don't think technology replaces that human element. Uh, it, it doesn't make it better than face-to-face -face by any stretch of the imagination. But if we have a relationship, this is a better way of staying in touch than just via the telephone. And it, it gives you the ability to see the reaction that you get. Because we are, you know, as a person, we, we need that. Good communication is just not words. It's seeing the expressions, knowing that the person is receiving the content well. Uh, you know, I, I've taught lots of things through the years. And, you know, I've done webcasts to teach. I'm not, I don't feel I'm good on, the, on, on that. Because when you do a web, um, a webinar, where you're speaking to maybe hundreds of people, but you can't see any of them. All you can see is a PowerPoint in front of you. You lose something, you know? Uh, as a teacher, I want to be able to see if the people are getting what I'm telling them. And you can see that little light in their eyes. You can see it. it and anybody that's taught or coached or, or led people, 
you can tell instinctively when they get it or when they or when they're still lost. You know, you you'll talk to somebody and you picture it, you'll feel it. And yeah, the webinars can't replace that because I can't see hundreds of people at one time and and conduct business over the internet. So I do like that interaction. And I, you know, I'm a people person. I love that. You know, I love hugging people. I'm a, I'm a hugger, you know, because well, I'm glad I we're on video them. Yeah, me too, man. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, that's the kind of stuff that, that I feed on as, a, as an individual. I, I believe people are so precious. All people are precious. And you, you need to make sure that you connect with those people. And I've been blessed to have some great mentors in my life that taught me this. They taught me the power of that. Og Mandino was one. Zig Ziglar, uh, an amazing gentleman. And you had to hug Zig. You couldn't just <laughs> rush, shake hands. You had to hug him once he knew you. And, and it, it changed how I did business, if you mm -hmm. will. So it's, it, was, it was beneficial to me. Yeah. And then, you know, I, I wonder if, uh, you know, as a, a solutionary yourself, like, you know, are there things that have come about in the industry or that are developing in the industry that, you know, have disappointed you that you're like, you know, I really expected this to really change the world. And then, you know, it just kind of fizzled. Yeah, yeah, there, there, there's one thing that I don't know if it fizzled, but it disappointed me. It, it disappoints me when we, we have to create or we feel we have to create laws or regulations over things that really don't need that. And one of the things that come to mind, for instance, is the fiduciary rule in the, in the profession that we have to now have a regulation that says you're a fiduciary to your client. Well, that's always been the case. I mean, no one in the financial service arena that's professional, honest, has integrity, would do anything other than the best interest for their client. I mean, that's always been the case. That's the foundation of what we do. We help other people create wealth. It, now, granted, there's always going to be the shady characters out there <laughs> that are going to do things wrong. I mean, that, that's always going to be the case. Even with the new regulation, there's going to be people that are going to do it wrong. So, you know, I just didn't see a need for that. I, it disappointed me that our public servants thought it was necessary to come out with wording that says you have to treat your client in the best interest of them. Well, yeah, that was always the case. I mean, yeah, right. never, <laughs> I, no one ever trained anyone in this profession to do anything other than that. It mm -hmm. was always with the best interest of the client. What's also interesting about that is the term fiduciary, for you to be a fiduciary, if I'm going to be your fiduciary, that means I have to know exactly what you know about your situation. Everything hmm. that you know, I have to know. So if you don't tell me that you have this special account set up somewhere else and you avoid telling me about that, well, I can't truly be a fiduciary because you have funds somewhere else that you didn't tell me about. Hmm. You know, so if I do anything, I'm going to make that decision based on incorrect data, not yeah, sure. all the information I need to make that decision as to what's in your best interest. So mm -hmm. for a fiduciary to be a true fiduciary, that person has to know exactly what the client knows. And if the client avoids telling me anything, which a lot of them do, a lot of them choose to have, you know, memory loss at certain times. <laughs> if they don't share that with their professional, then the decisions they make may not be in their best interest. Not mm -hmm. because the, the advisor didn't want it to be, but because the client, the, the advisor didn't have all of the facts. So it's very important that we get all of the facts on the table 
before we can make a, a good decision for the client. Yeah, that, that's interesting. That makes me think of uh, even, even this past week, uh, some issues going on in the you know in the financial services realm. Uh, you know, specifically around the advancements in messaging, right? So a lot of people were trading messages back and forth in non-secure, uh, you know, like WhatsApp or you know something yeah. like that. And, you know, I was just reading, I think, a New York Times article about it. And it's like, you know, there's maybe, a, I think, $1.3 billion lawsuit wow. against, you know, major financial institutions because, you know, as you said, like, these people know better than to communicate on those platforms, but they did it anyway. Yeah. You know, so how do you regulate the uh, the bad actors? That's always That's always a huge issue, right? It's always, that's right. Uh, I spent eight years as an expert witness for legal cases, and you'll always see those, like you said, bad actors that, you know, and, and to, be, to be honest, when I look back on those cases that I, I worked on, most people didn't intentionally try to do things wrong. They, they, they were trying to do what was right. They made one or two bad decisions that ended up being worse and worse as time went on. And then they got to the point where when they found out they made a bad decision, they made another bad decision by not stopping and saying, whoa, I did something wrong. I should fess up to it now. Instead, they tried covering it up and then it made things worse. Mm. So, you know, again, back to decision-making. When you know you did something wrong, it's always best to stop <laughs> and say, oh, uh, I think I made a mistake than, than to, to try to cover it up and hide it. And, you know, people are people. It's, you know, uh, I read a lot, of a lot of my research was from the BC era, you know, from Solomon's mm -hmm. time, King Solomon, who was supposedly the wisest man in the world. Well, you know, <laughs> people were making the same stupid decisions we make today 3,000 years ago. It wasn't different. We haven't changed much <laughs> in 3,000 years. The same stupid decisions we made then, we still make today. And for many of the same reasons, you know, that's the thing that, that's interesting when you start thinking about how people decide things and you know, we're more intelligent than we've ever been as a people. You know, we have these cell phones that at a drop, just at a push of a button, you can find out just about anything you want to find out. Mm. So we're, we're more intelligent than we've ever been, yet we make less wise decisions than we ever made. So interesting. So you mentioned uh, that, that that's a really interesting idea, you know, going back thousands of years, and we're still making the, the same bad decisions. Uh, and, you know, I, I'm not asking you to tell us all the secret sauce in your book. <laughs> but you know, what's like maybe one or two of the main things that stand out to you that like, these are the kind of the classic problems that, you know, people like Roy's who are, you know, kind of younger investors or you know building your their lives like what are the classic problems that people like me make good question there's only three that by the way there's only three solutions to every problem the right solution the wrong solution and what solomon called the acceptable concession he thought we intrinsically knew right and wrong Everybody does, by the way, because I, I th there's a, some research I did with a prison, 7,000 inmates, and they all knew they did wrong. You know, 100% of them knew they did wrong. So we know what's right. We know what's wrong. We choose something in the middle that'll give us as much pleasure as we can handle without as much pain as the wrong decision. So we balance this pain and pleasure kind of thing to get us to that acceptable concession. So it's kind of cool that, you know, that's one of the reasons why we still make silly decisions. Uh, but one of the, the main reasons we do as young people, we don't have a lot of experience. So our youth 
they make bad decisions for a very simple reason. They don't have the experience yet. So they're going, they, and they have limited education because let's face it, you know, if I'm only having 12 years of education, then I just know what I know, I, you know, I, and that's it. So the younger we are, we make bad decisions based on lack of information or lack of experience. As we get older, there's other things that kick in. For instance, if I'm self-indulgent, if I, if I do a lot of things because I have a drinking problem, because I have uh, other problems in my life and I make bad decisions based on those self-indulgences, well, uh, you know, you got to get out of that environment or you're never going to make a good decision. Um, you know, what's amazing to me is when people make bad decisions repeatedly, it's because of the environment they're in. It's because of these self-indulgences. They're, they're very selfish in nature and they always make decisions in the environment they're in. And if the environment's poor, the decision's gonna be poor. And, but for a, a young man like Royce, you know, you have the education, you have the experience of your age. And if you're thinking of doing the right thing and your conscience, you know, on those important decisions, you have to be conscious, this is important. So I can't just do it. I can't just make a decision and say, whatever happens, happens. So depending on the light, on the, the heaviness of the decision, the weight has to be given to the time to make the decision. So, yeah, it's it's interesting, Royce. I mean, and you know, Solomon was the so the wisest guy, and yet he had seven hundred wives. Not a wise decision, in my <laughs> opinion. So, I mean, not everything he did was wise, but you know, he we all make mistakes, and mm. and that's part of life. We're going to make mistakes. As when we're young, we make more fool, what we call foolish mistakes because we don't have the wisdom yet. We don't have that experience to fall back on. And then the people that do have the experience, you know, we don't believe them, you know. <laughs> they're they're yeah, the sure. parents, they don't know anything, you know. That's right. <laughs> so uh, kind of wrapping up here, you know, I appreciate you uh, taking some time to, to be with me on the podcast today. Uh, but maybe could, could you take a moment and just tell us uh, what you're working on? Like, what are the advancements that you're bringing to the industry? Beautiful. Yeah, be happy to. The American College is near and dear to my heart. Uh, I started in the business at a young age, and I was blessed to be introduced to the American College Financial Services quickly. So I started taking their courses at a young age. And, you know, here I am at 61, still taking courses at the American College. There's something wrong with that, Royce. I think maybe I'm not, I'm not the brightest bulb in the bush. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe that speaks to their good curriculum. Well, they do. They do have good <laughs> curriculum. And we're doing things very interestingly in the industry. We're, we're, we're starting to create um, financial literacy courses that, that advisors can share with their, with their clients to help educate them on wise decisions in finance. Uh, you know, when I was a kid growing up, we, we were taught in school how to balance a checkbook, what a credit card was. They don't do that anymore. Sadly, they don't. So a lot of children rely on their parents and some parents haven't received that education themselves. So we're doing a lot of stuff for the community a lot of outreach that is based on helping the community grow their knowledge of wealth, finance, insurance, anything having to do with money. That's what we teach. And, you know, one of the things that, that I've always been in, enamored with by the, about the college is it teaches content that's practical for the advisor and for the, the client, and they do so using all three elements of wisdom. To make a wise decision, you have to have education, you have to have experience, 
and you have to have ethics and morals because you'll never have a, a, a wise decision be unethical. If it's unethical, that kills it. It's not a wise decision. The American College has an ethics department and an ethics center that we've had for 95 years. When, when we came into existence, we did so understanding the importance of ethics in financial services. And all of our curricula has that ethical component. So you have the education, you have, pract you have uh, professors that have experience in financial services that they can bestow on others. And we have the ethics that teaches you the morals and, and the, the valuable beliefs that make what we do very, very important for our society. So yeah, I'm, I'm excited about what we're doing at the college. The college is part of my life. It has been for a long, long time. And uh, I'm very proud to be a part of the college. So uh, thank you for inviting me to be here. Thank you for, for uh, following me on LinkedIn because a lot of my uh, material that I write, I see your little likes next to it. So I appreciate that. And uh, it, it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure sharing time with you. Well, thank you for joining me and thank you for sharing your wisdom with us. <laughs> Whatever it is. Some people say, you know, I don't have much, but that's okay. And I'm still looking for well, we it. We can all have more, right? We can. That's exactly right. I'm still looking for it. <laughs> that's right. Thanks, Tony. Thank you, Royce. Have a wonderful day. You too. Bye-bye.